Hey, folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, and we talk about the Beatles here exclusively on this channel. And we always have great guests on this channel, and one who's been on here frequently and uh, has also been on uh, the Talk More Talk podcast and Two Legs podcast uh, is Luca Parasi. He's always a joy to talk to. He recently put out this incredible book, Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas, The Stories Behind the Songs, Volume 1, 1970 to 1989. We have him back with us because uh, we've had a few shows where we talked about all the 70s material, the first half of the 80s. And for this show, we're going to go a little bit deep on the Press to Play album. But welcome back, Luca. Thanks. Uh, Ken, it's good to be back in touch and um, on your show. So looking forward to delve into press to play and, uh, and uh, some other topics as well. Sure. So well, let's start. I thought at the very beginning of the show, we'd talk about this new book that you have coming out, which is uh, more of a detailed book about the Band on the Run album. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it is just out today in Italian, so it will take a few weeks more for the English version, which is basically ready. But we need uh, to do the layout uh, properly and stuff. So it's part of a new series of book of books uh, centered on specific albums. The series is called uh, Milestones. That means albums which are uh, very important in rock and pop history. So obviously being a Paul McCartney fan and, uh, and uh, you know, scholar, <laughs> I have started the series with Band on a Run. Uh, there would be other books by, maybe by other authors as well for my publishing, uh, little publishing company uh, on other artists, but uh, you know, starts off with band on the run i can tell you that uh, the, the follow-up at least for mccartney uh would be a ram which uh initially i have planned as a as a first volume of this series but then being a 50 years uh, of band on the run i thought well i cannot miss this anniversary so yeah, it's a different, a little bit different kind of book compared to the Music is Ideas one, because it's a, a little bit more on the narrative side. So it combines uh, an historical approach and narrative. So it gives me the opportunity to, you know, to analyze uh, a little bit more or to write uh, some of my opinions um, and stuff. But it has an historical approach as well, and it contains some things that uh, uh, are nice for all of us uh, fans because there are these little additions that I can uh, give to the story of the album. Mm -hmm. I want to mention just one thing, which is um, an interview I have done way back, well, 10 years ago, with uh, Pete Swettenham, which was an uh, assistant to Geoff Emerick uh, at Air Studios. So I interviewed him uh, way back and for some reason I couldn't find the interview and there was no space for the interview in the Music is Ideas book. But there are uh, some interesting uh, things in this uh, interview. So it's, uh, it, it's worth because it's one of the few people still alive, mm -hmm. sadly. <laughs> uh, because we're missing, uh, we're missing people. Um, that uh, was uh, part of the band on the run recordings. So I think it's a it's an interesting piece. So the book uh, is um, is a book with uh, uh, images in color for the interior. So it's uh, it has a nice uh, uh, layout. And uh, so I wanted also to analyze some aspects in depth uh, about this, the songs, and in particular about uh, Paul's drumming on the album. Uh -huh. So I just took time to uh, 
listen to the tracks and uh, you know there are a lot of um, um, isolated tracks over there so you can really understand what's going on instrumentally but in particular uh, about the, the drumming uh, which is interesting and then last but not least I try to um, to follow the narrative of Paul about the famous or infamous robbery <laughs> in Lagos mm. which is very interesting because I don't want to spoil the content but uh, he, if you follow uh, the way he has uh, spoken about it it's very interesting because there's a sort of pattern uh, over the decades and there are details and there are uh, little things that he adds or he omits uh, depending on the interview. And so it's very interesting to me to follow the way he has spoken about that stolen, uh, you know, who yeah. knows, demos, tapes, cameras, everything, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's something that we've talked about, especially on things we said today on the podcast. And since Alan Cozen is part of the show, you know, without going too much into what you may have in the book, it seems to me very unlikely that Paul McCartney would make one demo of the song from Ban on the Run, take it with him to Lagos, no. and, and he, he gets robbed and that's it. I mean, for him to make a no. cassette copy, he has to have a master to make it from. But no, sure. So uh, it just, um, and, and I'm talking about, well, there could be just simple demos or there could be multi-track recordings. But uh, And Denny Sywell has said that Paul kind of copied his drumming when they first started working on it. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting things. And, um, you know, w when you just simple, simply say, well, I, I got uh, this tape recorder uh, stolen or, or demos, it, it doesn't mean nothing. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, it was a, if they robbed him with uh, demos, uh -huh. uh, it was a copy. Uh, simple as that. I mean, uh, you you cannot you cannot have the the original master with you. Uh, a tape recorder is a tape recorder. So we, we got to consider it was 1973. Uh -huh. So yeah, probably a, a little cassette, which was a copy for him, just in case um, he wanted to <clears throat> really. Uh, understand better or remember better about this that specific song but there's a lot of uh, <laughs> little uh, <laughs> things that uh, that we can um, uh, rediscover uh, reading this book about band on the run so I will um, I will share with you when it will be out um, in English but it's just a matter of a few weeks okay that sounds good um also just a quick question i mean i'm sure by now you've heard the underdubbed <laughs> mix of ben on the run that just came yeah. what did you think of that well it's always a strange kind of uh, experience when you because you're accustomed to 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 the songs in in, in their full form so once once you go back and uh and listen to the songs without uh, overdubs and stuff is always a, a little bit strange. Uh, for me, uh, it works, but uh, I enjoyed better the Atmos mix. I was uh, invited by Universal to to do a listening of the Atmos, so there was the official uh, uh, thing here in uh, in Italy, uh -huh. and I enjoyed a lot the Atmos. Uh, mix the underdubbed. Uh, just make an, ex an example for me. Uh, you know, Bluebird has got a you know, without this fantastic sax solo, then you got a section which is basically empty. Mm. And uh, to me, it's just uh, uh, I don't know, it's not worth. Uh, I enjoy, I enjoy listening to, to anything that comes from Paul. And uh, so each any version of any song for me is welcome. If I get to tell you 
um, some uh, other things uh, um, are more enjoyable, like um, band on the run or, or jet, because you can hear a little bit more of uh, detail that were buried uh, in the mix after the, the orchestral overdubs and, uh, and other stuff. In some other cases, like Bluebird, it's just uh, you miss uh, a, a vital part of, of the recording. And and so Atmos Mix, uh, it was a revealing uh, experience because you can really hear very well uh, details and stuff, and you can hear more things. Uh, so I enjoyed uh, it uh, very, very much. Okay. I hope I, I get to hear the Atmos at some point. <laughs> I still haven't. Mm -hmm. But, um, and as far as Music is Ideas Volume 2 is concerned, when can we expect that to be out? Okay, the big thing, uh, the volume basically is, I, I think, 80% ready. Um, but there's one thing I I would like to add uh, to this volume 2, which is uh, Paul's new album, mm. which I don't know, uh, we don't know still, when it will be out, but I think it's worth to wait for this and then come out uh, with the book. Otherwise, we will have, uh, you know, the complete um, discography and all the songs uh, of Paul, except for a new album. Then you can say to me, well, but there would be something new, maybe into uh, maybe next year, maybe the, the 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 year after. Who knows? Because Paul doesn't stop. Okay. Uh, but I think uh, this new album um, is worth to be in in volume two. So that's basically what I'm what I'm waiting for. Okay, certainly worthwhile to wait for that. And uh, <laughs> but you also know, high in the clouds, yeah, should be coming out in 2026. Um, we still don't know about it's a wonderful life, <laughs> but. Uh, we know that's been in the pipeline for a while, but yeah. Anyway, and one more thing before we start talking about press to play is, um, and I didn't even know about this till I saw it on your Facebook page about the passing of Tony Clark, who was a good friend to you through the years. It yeah. even wrote the forward to this book of yours, which eventually led to Music is Ideas. So, yeah. would you like to share your thoughts about Tony and your friendship with him? Yeah, it's a, it's a big loss, and obviously it's always difficult to to talk about someone who passes away uh, all of a sudden. And um, I received a text message uh, um, on the 29th of February uh, from um, one of her daughters, and I I didn't have a a good feeling when I when I saw the text message, and then I got a a chat with her and um, and he passed away uh, all of a sudden because uh, I had a conversation with Tony at the end of uh, January and so I was planning um, another trip to 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 England uh, to his house uh, for spring summer uh, yeah, it was a an incredible uh, friendship because it all started with with this project uh, of interviewing him uh, for for recording sessions, and he accepted. Uh, I interview him, but it, it didn't stop there. He was so enthusiastic about uh, about uh, the fact that he could, uh, you know, contribute and um, have uh, his voice heard. And then, you know, uh, there was a human uh, connection, and so uh, he, he wrote this uh, little intro and uh, our quotes. Uh, um, from uh, from him um, uh, in the book, and then I invited him in uh, in Milan in um, October uh, 2013, and we we organized I organized for him a, a recording clinic uh, in a in a recording studio here in Milan, which is quite a quite important studio, and so he he had a, a chat before uh, the audience, and then he he showed couple of tricks from the recording console and it was a uh, very nice day all together and he was in Milan uh, two three days and I I got in London to visit him uh, 
in 2014. Um, and we spent uh, there with a friend of mine uh, four or five days, uh, uh, very, very nice days. Uh, yeah. And then I, I visited him again in 2022 twice. Uh, last time, uh, just after my visit to to NPL, mm, NPL was in the morning, and uh, I met uh, with Tony in the afternoon. So it was a very, very good friend of mine. I mean, we we were so close. Uh, so I got to 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 thank him for a lot of things during these years, because uh, as you were saying, um, well, recording sessions led to music as it is, but led mm. to other important things as well for me over the years. So, and he was very near and very nice when I lost my father uh, one year and a half ago. And he always had uh, the right words because he, he, he was a man who uh, spoke with his heart and he, 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 he taught me a lot of things and one thing that is maybe overlooked in in music uh, is that uh, uh, it's not really important how good you are on a, on a technical level, but a human connection is uh, is uh, absolutely key when you when you do when you make music. You know, mm -hmm. music is a it's a mean of communication, and that's uh, and that's it. So it was not for perfection or technical perfection it was for really capturing the moment and i think that wildlife really uh encompasses the the, the essence of uh tony as a as a sound engineer yeah and, so and as we know big it's loss beginning of, beginning of mumbo <laughs> yeah say take it tony yeah exactly it was uh, it was uh, mentioned uh by Paul and uh, and I think it's a unique uh, case of uh, um, at least in Paul's discography, sound engineer who's got his name on the records. Yeah, and he mentioned in the forward, uh, Red Rose Speedway, working on that and um, press to play. Ironically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hi Tony, uh, heavenly hi to Tony. You will be missed. Definitely. Definitely. So concerning Press to Play, before we talk about specific songs, um, the story has been, as many McCartney fans know, that um, Eric Stewart was working with McCartney through the Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, Broad Street sessions. And when it was time for Paul to move on to a different producer, uh, George Martin suggested to Eric Stewart, Stewart, why don't you produce Paul? And in the very beginning, at least that's what the plan was. And shortly after that, it changed to Hugh Padgham. Do you know why that happened? You know, anything behind the scenes? Because um, certainly based on what you have in your book, when they started working on Stranglehold together, uh, Paul was very pleased with the results with Eric. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Well, I don't have any, uh, you know, specific uh, insights about it. But what we have to consider, and which is a little bit uh, neglected uh, when we talk about the story of um, press to play, is that the sessions started without Youth Patkin uh, in March, around March uh, 1985, and it was Paul, Eric Stewart, and um, Martin Chambers on drums. And then after a few weeks, uh, they started from scratch. Again, this time with Jerry Marotta and you Padgham. So I don't know uh, if the initial sessions were intended for this album or were just, were just intended for laying down some tracks that Paul uh, wanted to do and he felt it was time to to go back in 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 the studio um let's remember that uh, paul uh has got a brand new studio his own studio mm. so it's just a 
it's not the first time that he recorded there because he, he did a couple of recordings uh, in 1984. I think we got married and um, a couple of other tracks before that. But this it was the, the first time that Paul entered his own studio to make an album. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened in the middle. Um, maybe um, Paul felt uh, he needed... Um, uh, a different um, collaborator and uh, you Pelgrim was was really high at the time and he just felt uh, that he could add uh, something to to these recordings but we never heard uh, the initial recordings that Paul made with uh, with Eric Stewart and, and Martin Chambers so we don't know if uh, there was a change of uh, plan in the middle in which was the reason behind it. So it's still unclear. Okay. So just to be sure, maybe what we heard about Eric Stewart being the producer may not have been totally true? Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit blurred. I don't think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's very clear because uh, uh, we would need a, really a, a, a specific and clear timeline about mm. what happened when, which is still still not not very clear. Although Eric Stewart uh, put out uh, this um, autobiography uh, in 2017, and it delves a bit uh, into into the the sessions and stuff. But uh, when it comes to when some specific uh, events happened it's not that specific so i don't know i don't know really what uh, to add uh, about this uh, this thing but anyway it's uh, it's an interesting uh, project and an interesting uh, album anyway oh definitely uh, i've said many times well, flowers in the dirt is my favorite mccartney album press to play is number two. <laughs> oh, really uh yeah and it's been that way for a long time. So I allow myself to make changes over the years, but it's been pretty consistent. I like Press to Play a lot because Paul went in an entirely different direction. I shouldn't say entirely because there's some songs on there that are more traditional Paul, like Only Love Remains and Footprints and uh, Move Over Busker, uh, Stranglehold. Um, but the more 80 sound, which was approached here with you on songs like press um pretty little head talk more talk um those are more experimental and i like when paul takes chances and does something different that the average person out there would not expect him to do the people who study him and know his catalog thoroughly are not necessarily shocked because he he experiments a lot and tries so many different things and um but it has still to this day a very fresh sound, though some people will say it's very much an 80s album and it has the 80s sound and it sounds dated. And, you know, I still love 80s music. It's it's something I listen to continuously. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't look at it as being a dated sound. But anyway, what uh, Paul said about you um, on MTV, and I'm taking this from your book, there's a lot of great quotes in here. He said, I knew that if I work with Hugh, one thing like the drum sound would be good because he really gets a great sound. And this is the anchor of your album. Well, so it's kind of interesting that that Paul thinks that how important the drum sound is. Yeah, and definitely we, we got to say that uh, the drum sound here, it's, uh, it's very powerful, very you know, steady. And, uh, and I think Jerry Marotta does uh, does an, a great job and uh, and it's uh, it's different from um, from other from other albums so definitely there's a, I think the drum sound it's, a, it's quite a, a trademark in this uh, in this album uh, you know it, it just just a few example uh, I think uh, was particularly powerful on on strangle old it's it's a it's a dry kind of uh, kind of sound. It's very energetic. Mm. There's a uh, there's a lot of uh, um, you know 
uh, roles and uh, and, uh, and other stuff on good times coming and the transition between the the, the two the two tracks uh, so uh, definitely they 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 did something specific for the drum sound on this uh, on this album yeah so and it's and it's and it's played i mean uh, there there are other things as well uh, you know drum machines and stuff uh, but drum is basically live and throughout the the whole uh, the whole press play album it's very pronounced all the way through yeah yeah um, are you familiar with this bootleg the alternate press to play oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's a favorite of mine and uh and it really is interesting the changes the editing that was done with feel the sun because there was so much more developed in the song and it was trimmed down to maybe a minute and a half on the album but uh that's one of the 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 big changes that i noticed in any of the songs from from that bootleg but uh it certainly is worth investigating because i really like the long version <laughs> oh yeah it's it, i think it's one of the best unreleased tracks or bits of tracks uh, in, in paul's catalog it's it's a uh, second half it's uh, it, it's definitely worth uh, a release one of my, one of my favorites uh, uh, absolutely it can well i hope that uh if the time ever comes when there's an art <laughs> set that that's included in there um about about you um and again to people who've studied this know all the the whole backstory anyway but um the big difference here apparently between Hugh and Eric Stewart was that Hugh didn't think much of the material Eric did but he didn't like the production <laughs> that was a... <laughs> but this is an actual quote that Hugh gave um after Paul gave him a cassette of the demos he worked on with Eric, he said, I can honestly tell you now that I was underwhelmed when I heard those songs. I thought, well, hang on, who am I to know? As a little 28-year-old 20 -old guy that Paul McCartney has given me these songs that are not very impressive. It must be me not being able to sort of see these songs that are effectively them sitting around a campfire with a couple of acoustic guitars. So it is probably an awkward thing for Hugh to have to deal with. You know, you're dealing with one of these legends who's had so much success. You know, who is he to say the songs aren't that strong? And it's mm. difficult for any producer. I mean, George Martin, one of the great things about George Martin was that he had a delicate diplomatic way of saying things to Paul, like, why don't you try this instead or whatever? And um, in the case of Hugh, being so much younger than Paul, um and not having all that history and success behind him although Hugh had all this success with the police and genesis and the solo members of those groups but um you know how do you how do you um you know relate to the experience well, somebody like a younger uh producer um, had has to deal with with paul well if he wasn't convinced of the material why he, he didn't tell paul as simple as that he yeah. accepted he accepted to work uh, uh on on uh, on the album uh with um well relying on uh, on material he, he he thought it was not good enough so that's a uh, that's a big problem that's a big issue uh, i understand what the he said uh, being 28 and younger and having the opportunity to work with Paul McCartney, then you can say, well, yes, but then who cares? I mean, it's uh, it would be part of my CV. Who can who can really say I have worked with Paul McCartney? But you got to, you know, to have the courage to say, well, do you get some more songs? <laughs> have you got some more songs? Uh, because if you accept, then you're part of the problem. Uh, then you cannot say, you cannot blame Paul because the songs are not good enough. You say, you accept to work on this song. So this is the material. What you can do to better a, a song with through a production. Uh, my personal opinion, Nick, you can do nothing. 
So that's why George Martin, uh, diplomatically or not, said to Paul, can you write some more? <laughs> uh, can you just give me some more songs because this three or four or five are not good enough? Then you can uh, be the, uh, you know, uh, you can be like George Martin and uh, touching the right uh, strings mm. uh, or using the, the right words to communicate with Paul, right? which is the best thing to do. Uh, or you can, well, you can also, uh, you can also act uh, like uh, Elvis Costello or, or, or Nigel Godrich and using not the right words, but the concept, when the concept is right, Paul knows it. So if you say this song is not good enough and Paul uh, inside of him uh, knows you right, is going to work on the song again. So if no one says to him, Paul, there's something missing here, mm. then he goes ahead. But that's a problem with uh, with someone big uh, as uh, as McCartney. Uh, the, the yes man issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that you was a, a yes man, but it, it didn't he didn't have the courage to to tell him as far as we are concerned we, we don't know but it's just i'm assuming that he accepted uh this role without without being convinced of the quality of the songs now that's that's a that's a capital uh issue <laughs> well i was thinking there was a possibility that hugh did say to paul that you could do better because this is where we get the quote from Paul, Hugh, when did you write your last number one? Uh, this is a specific, uh, you know, instance uh, uh, that was related to, to uh, uh, a vocal part or something, which, uh, I mean, uh, in the studio, uh, when people work in the studio, a, a lot of things happen. Hmm. And... Um, you know, you can be not in the right mood. And if you're not in the right mood, uh, maybe you can, you, you are struggling to nail a part. Uh, as we were saying before, music is a mean of communication. When you are in a bad mood, song uh, is not right. <laughs> uh -huh. So if you got to, to, to nail a vocal part and... Um, and the mood is not right. Uh, w w whichever is, whatever is the reason, um, then um, uh, the role of the producer or anything is, which is in the room, is to say, well, can you can you just try once more? Then you can react badly. Maybe it was just uh, you know that particular day. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the quality of the songwriting. Uh, we don't know if uh, uh, you told anything to Paul. Then when it comes to the performance, that is another another uh, different thing. So you're certain that, that Paul's comment had to do with his vocal? The, the... Uh, if I'm not, uh, well, I, I'm just, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just trying to remember Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed to me that this specific uh, uh, incident happened uh, when Paul was recording a vocal part, because I think it's, report it's reported also um, by Eric Stewart. Uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, trying to put the pieces together. But anyway, it was something related to the performance and not to the songwriting, because the songwriting comes before, and that's uh, the first quote that you mentioned by by huge well i heard the song and it seemed to me the song were not exceptional then they came into the studio and i, I don't know when it happened uh, he asked paul to to do it again and paul says well uh, <laughs> when you when you when you wrote your last number one you uh, then we don't have uh, we don't have the Paul's side of the story in this right. uh, in this case, 
But anyway, you know, something happened. <laughs> I've, I've pointed out many times, it's easy to blow one statement out of proportion, you know? Yeah. You got to know all the circumstances surrounding it. But, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Hugh also said, uh, well, this is another quote from him. Paul McCartney became quite annoying as far as I'm concerned. After sort of a year of every day in the studio, he's not on the same pedestal as when you started. And I don't think he was in an era of writing good songs. Um, so also, he's, he's giving you the impression they spent a lot of time together working on this album. He's saying a year. Yeah. It's really, a, you know, a long time for one producer to be working constantly with the same person over and over again. So it's a fascinating aspect of someone like Paul because some of the albums he's worked on, he'll record in a few days and some of them he labors on for a year or longer. So um, I guess he was not used to that, to that experience. Having that kind of freedom, you know, mm. to spend as much time as, as Paul wanted to at that time for this album. Yeah, well, this this is another uh, different aspect to me. Uh, it's more concerning uh, human relationship in the studio, which, I mean, uh, this is a quote that uh, makes us feel that maybe nothing bad happened, but maybe they just didn't click the way it clicks with, with, with someone else. Which happens? Uh, well, one year of recordings is uh, it's uh, it's too much, in my opinion. <laughs> it's too much, and and it's proof that uh, that is something it, it it's not working. We we all know that Paul went through uh, remakes uh, uh, and remixes of of the songs, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to anticipate maybe what you are going to to quote after, but there's a um, a meaningful quote by Paul that was uh, that was done uh, during the promotion of the album. So after after the recording were finished, which to me is the key to to understand uh, really what's uh, what was going on. So at um, some point, um, Paul said that uh, he had a dream or a nightmare, let me say. He had a dream uh, that he had done uh, a dreadful album with, uh, with Huge. And, and, and so, he, he, uh, and so he, he tells this to, to Huge. And, uh, and so they, they took this as, as a little warning in trying to to do a good album which i mean if you if you just uh, um uh, do this statement do this kind of statement after the album is out to me is just a technique to say i'm not convinced of this album which i think is a, the big thing uh paul was not convinced about the album he tried to 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 do different things. He tried to approach the songs in a different way. Uh, prime example is uh, "Pretty Little Head," mm -hmm. because the single is completely different from uh, from the album uh, version, or at least it tries to do tries to work on uh, on the song and uh, make it more more commercial. <clears throat> but this quote from Paul is uh, probably some sums up uh what what he thought about uh about uh, his songwriting and 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 the work about about the album there's so many questions i want to ask you because one thing <laughs> to say here will lead to something that has nothing to do with the questions i have prepared but do you think that there are times when Paul is just way too affected by the commercial success or lack thereof of some of his albums. I mean, if Press to Play had been a number one album, he probably would be praising it. Yeah. Yeah. I think at the time, he was still uh, a little bit concerned uh, about the commercial success mm. uh, at the time. Uh, 
so he wanted definitely uh, the album to be successful. Uh, but uh, I think he plugged it in a strange kind of way because I, 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 my personal opinion is that intimately he was insecure about it. And so he plugged it not uh, not in his best, uh, not using his best <laughs> mm. skills. He, he did a wonderful job because uh, is when when Paul comes in and um, and wants to plug something, I think generally speaking is uh, uh, unmatched. He knows uh, what to do. He knows what to say. So, but if you just uh, if you just uh, go through the promotion of that album, I think there are a couple of instances when he, he was not really that convinced, and and it comes out maybe in little spots, and uh, <laughs> you got to be a psychologist to to you know to analyze the micro expressions. And stuff, but um, there's uh, there's definitely something uh, that tells us uh, he was not really 100% convinced of uh, the quality of the album, which didn't show, for example, during the promotion of Flowers and the Dirt, which he knew it was a great album. He knew he knew it was uh, one of the best things. He, he ever had, he ever did, um, and it shows. It shows in the promotion. It's a different promotion. If you go through the promotion of Flowers, which obviously was linked to the World Tour and all the stuff, and you go through the promotion of Press to Play, you can feel the difference. That's that's uh, that's it. Because the man himself could not lie. You could not lie about your own work. So you can you can plug it, you can do your best effort, but uh, lying beneath the surface, there's uh, there's something that shows that uh, that there's there's differences between the two albums, also in terms of promotion by Paul. It's a shame that he didn't think more highly of uh, Press to Play because I think it's an outstanding album. You know, and uh, I like when, like I said, artists take chances and they do something different and it's not, you know, I'm not a formula person, you know, I don't want, as much as I love an album like Tug of War, I don't want every album from Paul to be the, the next Tug of War. He mm -hmm. albums vary, especially from Press to Play On. They all have a different vibe, a different production to them. The one common link is that they're all McCartney songs. They all come out of the same brain. But the people that you work with that work on the album and the songs have been an influence on how they're shaped in some way. So, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big difference between the 70s when Paul produced everything for the most part. Yeah. But, you know, most of the time. Um, just a little tidbit of information I didn't know about was that Paul got in touch with Ricky Nelson. Mm -hmm. Have him sing for the album. So he would have done mm -hmm. backing vocals, but of course he died in a, a tragic plane crash. Yeah, of, uh, 1985. That would have been nice <laughs> to mm -hmm. know that Nelson was working with Paul. Definitely. Also, um, Talk More Talk seems to have been recorded apart from the press to play sessions, um, with you, or just because he wasn't available on that day. Either with you or yeah, not available on that day. And you said originating from "It's Not On," the track is the outcome of an improvised session, which it does sound like improvised. But you know, when you when you listen back to back, "It's Not On" and "Talk More Talk," you can hear the similarities and playing yeah. around with the different voices that are there—a lower voice and a high voice while Paul singing in a normal voice. You know, mixing the two and harmonizing it together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's interesting um, to to note uh, this kind of um, uh, little similarities. Yeah, the the, the this this uh, little song uh, was definitely the the sort of uh, initial 
idea to talk more talk, which Paul said it was recorded in one day. Uh, well, it could be. Uh, I imagine that uh, he could um, have done in a, in a single day, maybe with uh, with a uh, with another um, engineer or or whatever. Uh, and he tried to is is gear from uh, from his new from his new studio. So there's a, there's a, probably there's a sequencer, there's drum machines, there's a lot of stuff going on yeah. in this uh, specific uh, uh, song, which is uh, is interesting to 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 see Paul doing uh, this kind of uh, uh, experimental, let's call it experimental stuff. Yeah, definitely. Talk more talk is one of the the two big experimental tracks in. Uh, along with uh, with pretty little head sure and so that's a you know uh, adds a specific uh, flavor to to the album i mean as you were saying uh, the the one of the great thing with mccartney uh, mccartney's catalog is that each album is so different from the other hmm. so definitely Press to play is different from anything else he has done. So when you're in the mood for for press to play, I enjoyed uh, a lot. You know, listening to the album and delving into the album, all these little instruments here and there that you can that you can uh, uh, hear. And so, yeah, it, it's a it's an experience. Uh, you're in the mood for press play, go for press play. And that's what I do. <laughs> I'm almost always in the mood for press to play. <laughs> Did you mention Pretty Little Head? There's a similarity there. Like you said, experimental with Talk More Talk. Same thing with Pretty Little Head. It was really, it came out of a jam session. Mm -hmm. And um quote from Paul here uh, about that song. I don't like trying really to be very commercial. I think it would be all Eurovisioned um, if every track was a snappy, catchy hit. So on some of the tracks, we've definitely gone anti-commercial. Hmm. It's funny because at the same time, then he releases it as a single. <laughs> uh, yeah, to, if you, if you ask me, I'm not uh, I'm not really um, convinced that. Uh... For this this quote is a kind of a strange quote. I know I know what 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 Paul means uh, with it, but uh, to, to some extent, I, I think that Paul, in in the back of his mind, wants wants uh, every song being a snappy catchy hit. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, he, he he just went through a remake of uh, of Pretty the Head, although it's uh, probably he, he just not. Uh, mm, yeah, it's a, it's it's the, it's very different, the single version from the the album version. I think that uh, the vocal part is uh, is different. Uh, uh, there are some uh, some harmonies. Um, I don't know if we're if they were added or they just they just pulled out uh, different uh, harmonies or different parts from the multi track because also the bass part which is a sort of a slap slap bass part mm. seems that it was buried in the multi track and uh, when they mix it remix it they found it uh, a bass part lying there, so it's interesting. Uh, unfortunately, all this little detail are somewhere stored in Paul's archives. So we're waiting for for a big archive of uh, press to play to solve uh, all of these mysteries, or at least part of this mystery. Yeah. Well, the big difference for me in the single version of Pretty Little Head is that Paul's vocal is a solo vocal standing by itself, you know, whereas mm -hmm. on the album version, he's like part of 
background vocals, you know, for the most part. Yeah, it's definitely more prominent, and there's a there's a different effects uh, applied to 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 this part, and uh, yeah, definitely it's, it's you can enjoy more the melody in in the single version compared to the album version, which has got a, a, a completely different approach, also for the vocals. Yeah. yeah. An interesting thing that's in in your book is that Paul said he wasn't confident about his bass playing at that time. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, on the the Talk More Talk podcast, we did a show recently on Give My Regards to Broad Street on the album. And I noted how on many of the songs, Paul didn't play bass. And if you take a look at some of the songs on Press to Play and Flowers in the Dirt, he let somebody else play bass. So it's kind of interesting. If you, plenty of times Paul wants to play drums on these tracks, on press to play, and so uh, it's just an interesting aspect. Here's someone who's looked at as being one of the most inventive bass players, and he <laughs> have confidence at that time about his bass playing. At least that's one thing he said. Yeah, but in the end, I think except for, I think uh, only love remains where. We have a synth bass. Mm. Uh, I think on all the rest of the songs, he he plays uh, he plays bass uh, throughout the album. But anyway, it's it's a uh, it's kind of uh, uh, meaningful that uh, he was thinking about uh, hiring uh, someone else. That 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 gives us a flavor of. Um, Paul being uh, not in his best uh, uh, period uh, uh, when when it comes to to confidence, mm. and so it is linked to what I was saying before about uh, him being uh, uh, not so convinced about his songwriting. So songwriting, mm, he was not convinced. Uh, bass playing, uh, maybe we are. We're thinking about hiring someone else, so that gives us, uh, uh, you know, a picture of Paul uh, mid '80s Paul being kind of, um, you know, uh, having some issues. Mm. Then we we know what happened after. Just thinking about the same subject, even going back to Tug of War and Pipes of Peace, you have Stanley Clark there, and yeah, were you to say no to Stanley Clark in a way? Yeah, Herbie Flowers and uh, people like yeah, that. Yeah, but I mean, in the case of Paul McCartney, when when he when he speak about Paul, uh, it's not possible to to really consider him as a bass player. Is a bass player because he plays bass. And he plays bass live, and he's played bass uh, w with the Beatles. Uh, but he's a composer, is is a guitar player, is a piano player, is uh, uh, got a lot of uh, ideas in his mind. And at some point he went uh, for classical music, and so you got to do different things. So his mind is not only a mind of a bass player. Is 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 a is a mind of a of a player, generally speaking, someone mm. who plays music, a lot of instruments, who composes music, writes songs and write music, not only songs. So maybe at that time he was thinking about um, about himself in different terms. And so he said, "Well, maybe uh, I'm going to do something different. I'm not playing bass, but you know then." When it comes to his bass playing, we all know that uh, it's so inventive that uh, it maybe doesn't need anyone else. Yeah. But from his own perspective, uh, there was something different in his mind, and that's and that's it. You know, that's that's very perceptive. I think that's a really good way of looking, at least maybe how he looks at himself. But yeah. I just reminded me of um, Paul being asked the question and why certainly in the wings days um he didn't devote as much time to his bass lines and he said mm. that um he had to pretty much 
do everything in wings. He had to be the leader. He had to be a businessman. He had to, there's so much other work that goes around the music. In the Beatles, if John wrote a, a song there, he can focus just on his bass playing on a certain song. Whereas yeah. on his own, he had to pretty much do everything. Or at least lead the band too, you know. Yeah, but then you know uh, you cannot really reinvent uh, the 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 wheel uh, for every single song and coming up with uh, with uh, an incredible or the most incredible baseline. Uh, anyway, he he, he he came up with with see love songs. He came up with with uh, good night tonight, and you know. So I always feel that the bass part. Um, on Paul songs are are, are the best uh, because they are what the song needs and that's uh, that's so it can be simple it can be played by uh, someone else you know uh, let's let's take a, a, you know a, just a, a an example let's take the bass part for um, let them in mm. you know it's just a two, three, maybe four notes it's played by Jim and McCulloch. Yeah. And it's what the song needs because the song has got so many things in the arrangement. And if you put a, a complicated bass part, then you could kill a song. But then you got a the quite complicated bass part for silly love songs and that makes a song. Right. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> That's it. Well, Paul knows what's necessary. He's very yeah. in that regard. Um, for only love remains. I like the way the whole thing was was recorded. It said recorded the rhythm track in the morning, the orchestral instruments in the afternoon, then a version that had the orchestra and band playing together. There were three vocal takes from Paul, all of which were perfect. And Hugh Padgham chose the best bits from the three different vocals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there's also the single version of of that of that song too. A little bit different because of the sax playing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th there are a couple of things I want to I want to say. The first is that if you go through the description of this uh, song, "All Love Remains" in my book, there's a lot of interesting quotes from uh, Hugh Padgham about the recording, as you were as you were mentioning. Now, so it's it's a uh, it's fascinating because we can go through the the whole process, and at the same time, it seems that uh, you is very uh, clear in you know noticing uh, the quality of Paul vocal performance, mm. and also the quality of the song because it speaks. He, he, he delves into into the song and the recording process, and it seemed to me that he, he likes this specific song, which probably was not part <laughs> of the cassette that he that he was sent. <laughs> anyway, and um, well, there was another thing that, that now um, I wanna I wanted to mention, but. Uh, it seems that I'm forgetting it. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> okay. There's still plenty more to talk about here. Yeah. How much more time do you think you have? Well, we got 20 minutes. Okay, good. Um, let's talk about press. Mm -hmm. Carlos Alomar really loved playing on press. He was very impressed with that song in particular. And he overdubbed the arpeggiated guitar parts. And there's a quote from Carlos. I went to Sussex and when I arrived, I spoke with Paul for two hours. Then he asked me if I wanted to play on tracks that I find interesting. Press was the first track I heard. I was so anxious to please him immediately. And this was the most enjoyable song I played. It had some guitar parts that he had put down, but it wasn't finished. He told me he told me to play. So I did. And he went crazy. He thought it was fantastic. What you hear on the record is my second take. This is your interview, actually, with Carlos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which uh, is interesting to, because I well remember that was my very first interview I, I ever done 
uh, with a musician uh, for the recording session book initially. So mm. that Carlos Salomar was the first person I have ever interviewed back in 2011, <laughs> which uh, was nice because he had um, a lot of uh, memories and great memories about the sessions, about his uh, collaboration with Paul. And, uh, and I think he contributed some great uh, guitar. I think the, the guitars on, on press are one of the best things. I mean, it's a, it's a commercial uh, 80s pop uh, song mm. and still got a lot of guitars going on, not only synths and, uh, and drum machines and stuff. You got, there's, a, there's a real drums, there's really guitars and great solo by 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 McCart himself. Yeah. So I was a little bit uh, deluded at at the time when uh, it was not a, such a big hit. I thought it was uh, it was quite uh, good in terms of uh, charts. I think it charted uh, um, twenty five in the in the US or something like that. Uh, 21 i think 21 yeah maybe 21 it was 25 in in the uk or something. so not that bad yeah hmm? not that bad but at the time as a young fan i was expecting a little bit more though in italy it charted quite uh, well and and i think the video helped a lot mm -hmm. at the time it was a nice uh, video clip cheapest video he ever did <laughs> one of the cheapest but <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that Paul kind of relied, well, once you're getting into 80, 89, 90 for his tour with a lot of Beatles material, and you got things like um, the end of Spies Like Us, the video where he's walking across Abbey Road with Dan Aykroyd and uh, mm -hmm. um, Chevy Chase and relying on the Beatles thing. And if you watch the the press video, there's someone who's pointing to Paul, you know, saying like, "Are you a Beatle?" <laughs> Whatever, mm. you know. It's like he's very comfortable with the whole Beatles thing. It's really coming to the fore by the time of the eighty nine ninety tour. Did yeah. that? Do you think that he was starting to rely too much on it? No, too too much is not. Uh, when when we talk about the Beatles, it's not too much. I know that. Uh, uh, for some of us or a lot of us, uh, when it comes to uh, solo career, there's always a bit of, uh, you know, uh, if the Beatles comes, uh, come, uh, then the solo career is neglected. But for Paul, it's not, it's not mm, possible to think uh, this way, uh, or at least uh, he knows uh, what to do. Uh, but we got to consider, you know, uh, just Paul McCartney as an artist. Uh, he was relying on the Beatles, uh, definitely. He he just had uh, uh, the remakes of Beatles hits mm. for Broad Street. Broad Street. The, that was a that was a key moment when he switches mm. uh, uh, when he switches. Uh, and thinks about the Beatles in different terms. During the promotion of Press to Play, he, he was relying on the Beatles and John. I think there were some uh, some hints uh, during the promotion of Press to Play. So, yeah, definitely he was thinking about uh, the past in different terms. And I think uh, this is the first. Um, well, not the first, because I, as I was saying, uh, Brosset, but Brosset was a, a specific project. So I think that the first hints to the Beatles uh, appear during the promotion of uh, Tug of War, because of the fact that John has passed away quite recently. Uh, at the time of Press to Play, he was uh, balancing a bit more uh you know the information about the new song and songs and uh, and uh, the hints uh, to the past which is something that was exploited uh 
you know, uh, on on the on the flowers and the dirt era mm. more and more. You know, yeah. But yeah, definitely is trying to balance uh, uh, the current uh, uh, kind of uh, information and and uh, and things and promotion with. Uh, well, I was I was in the Beatles. Don't believe what I said. <laughs> <laughs> John was not the genius. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it's uh, mm, it's something that um, he he wanted to do. Uh, he deserved to to be recognized because at some point we all know that uh, a part of the press was uh, was playing uh, was mm. playing uh, with with this um, image and and with the image of John. To the benefit of uh, of uh, you know the general audience are trying to to sell some uh, some more copies of uh, of their magazines or their newspapers. So I think Paul chimed in and uh, and did a great uh, job. It was not easy, uh, incredibly, because uh, you cannot uh, really uh, believe for one second that he has to chime in and claiming his uh, his legacy. Uh, about the Beatles, but he had to do it, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was not something that uh, he could avoid. Right. Also, in the video for uh, "Pretty Little Head," the very beginning, they use "She's Leaving Home." Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's that uh, tells us uh, something. Yeah. <laughs> going back to press in in defense of that line that everybody picks on oklahoma was never like this this is what paul had to say about it it can mean whatever you want it to mean to me when you're writing songs you get a line you assume you're going to edit later but every time i came to that line i couldn't sing anything but that it was just the scanning it's a symbol for the provinces the sticks the out of the way places the line just wouldn't change. And when you meet such resistance from the lyrics themselves, you have to give in. I think he, he uh, explained himself pretty well there. Mm -hmm. It's when maybe you just can't improve upon the lyrics and it just works well and it flows well. So go with it. But he got a lot of flack for that line. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the way pop music works is exactly... Uh how Paul is uh, describing in, in this uh, in this instance. Uh, well, I can tell you that um, uh, it happened even to me. I mean, uh, when I was young and, and I grabbed my, my guitar and trying to, you know, come up with something in fake English, mm -hmm. I can tell you that some sometimes you find that obviously in my case, not being mother tongue, I can come up with the silliest kind of thing, things. And sometimes when you find a line in this fake English and you, you find a, 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 this line and you it sticks for months or even years and stuff, then you cannot change it. You cannot change it. It's really difficult because it's this line that you got in mind and it means nothing but you know as paul was saying it scans very well <laughs> so you say why i sh i should struggle with another uh line when i got uh, this thing okay it doesn't mean nothing but who cares i mean we were not necessarily uh asking for uh, meaningful lines all the time. Sometimes we just want to uh, sing along with a song. And sometimes it works better. Sometimes not so much, but, you know, it's pop music. It's music. It's pop. It's uh, just words sometimes. And then when you're happy, you bring out uh, these words and you, you're happier. Mm -hmm. You know? So <laughs> no, I, I can relate to all this because I used to sing songs as a kid where I just sang along with the words without thinking about what it meant. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they were the wrong words because I couldn't make out phonetically what they were saying. And it didn't matter to me. So 
Yeah, but th th this is a clever thing that Paul says because um, when, when you, well, we're talking about Paul McCartney, we're talking about the Beatles. So there's a, there's a mother tongue uh, uh, audience or, you know, uh, that speak English, but there's a lot of people who uh, in part determine the success of uh, the Beatles over other artists, which are not mother tongue. So in Italy, you, you, you can find a lot of, uh, or hear, listen to a, a lot of songs in English. Uh, maybe you have studied English anyway, but you maybe you don't have the words uh, with you and you just feel uh, you know listen to the melody to 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 the feel uh, and stuff so f many people don't care about it right <laughs> so many other things to admire in a recording you know and it could be the melody it could just be the vocals in the song that attract mm -hmm. you you know it could be any number of things yeah music is so magical on many levels you know, and some people are heavily into lyrics, other people are not. Yeah, but that means that you you are well aware that you are relate you you are relating to a lot of people who don't speak your own language mm -hmm. and music right. break the barriers, and that's it. So Paul is very uh, aware and conscious of 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 that. You know, he can relate to to anyone in the world because English is very uh, popular, but you know, you don't have to to be necessary necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, uh, to necessarily uh, be so uh, well accustomed to English to understand or to appreciate to, to that kind of music or that specific song. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, for move over busker. You said it was recorded live in the studio with spontaneous a spontaneous approach. Originally intended for press to play, Eric Stewart said, I think Paul had the desire to get back to some of the early recordings of the Beatles when you go in and record an album in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. so, you know, some of this album, they wanted to work on the songs quickly. Mm -hmm. And then, like Hugh Padgham was saying, you know, they, they spent, you know, over a year working on the album. So uh, it's kind of funny. Some songs you labor on some ones you just want to you know do real fast and get that vibe of spontaneity yeah so even even in a in an album like press to play uh we got uh different sides we got uh, uh live uh performances uh we got uh uh scintillating uh 80s pop uh we got experimentation we got a, a variety of moods which is what we like, no? About uh, about Paul McCartney. Oh yeah, "Angry" is a song that I loved from the start. I I love the rawness of it. I love the bass line, which you very cleverly in your book say was really mm -hmm. taken from Soily, which is true in a way. It's very similar to what mm -hmm. Paul played on Soily, and uh, you know to have Pete Townsend and um, Phil Collins on that track was really special. Kind of wish they did more work together. But that really was the result of of uh, recording the song quickly after Live Aid, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I always uh, felt that it's a really a shame that uh, the single version with this big horns is yeah. not on the album, because that was uh, that was uh, the best remix that he he, he, he got uh, from from uh, from the press of play. Uh, uh, tracks so it's a it's a, it's a shame and that lead me sorry to 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 change subject but to the the other the other thing that i forgot before about uh, um uh, on love remains so that uh, uh we have a a third version of uh, only love remains which is out there which is the version that has been released on the on the seven singles box because the version there has got sax parts which are different even from the single version so hmm. uh it's little known maybe but it's worth uh telling that uh 
the version which is uh, on the seven single box is not really the version. It's not really the single version. It's different because the sax uh, bits are different. So probably, I don't know if it was done on purpose or not. Maybe they got uh, back to the multi-track and they just <laughs> and just just messed up with uh, with the faders and uh, and they selected um, other bits uh, because you know you know that uh, at the time they were using a lot of tracks so a lot of channels uh, and so maybe they just selected uh, another performance but it's nice to have uh, another version. <laughs> of it <laughs> you heard it here folks you know i i didn't buy the box set unfortunately i just had somebody send me uh mp3s of all the stuff that's really rare that it hadn't been released before so you uh, can stream it you can stream it uh can you can stream it okay if you I want. check it out but um surprised i haven't heard that one found yeah. it interesting there was that other it's a uh, walking in the well <clears throat> There are subtle uh, differences. I think also the keyboard parts, uh, it's a little bit different, but if you listen to to this two version side to side, you can uh, you can definitely spot it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I certainly want to get into the bonus tracks, but we're kind of pressed for time, but no pun intended there. Um, <laughs> However absurd, we'll just we'll we'll talk about that because um, there are times when, as mentioned in your book, Paul just worries about, oh, that's a little bit too beetly or something like that, and then he also knows, yeah, but I'm one of the four of them. I have the right to do this. However absurd is definitely very, uh, very beetleish. And Jerry Murata thought it was very Leninish in particular, and he had Ann Dudley do the orchestration on it which i think was mm -hmm. a wonderful job on there i always find it interesting how paul chooses some of the people to work on these albums because to me it must mean if he's, <clears throat> he's thinking about ann dudley maybe he's familiar with the art of noise and and their work or works with eddie rayner on uh you know spies like us so mm -hmm. you know split ends and crowded house and so it, it makes me think what music was Paul McCartney were list, listening to at that time. But <laughs> um, however absurd was was another one of those cases where, and then sometimes you get this on Flowers in the Dirt and some of the comments that were said, there were, there's just moments when Paul will say, oh, that's too John, you know, when he was working with Elvis Costello. It's, it's how do you bridge the gap as to how far you can go? And um, however absurd is one of the most Beatlesque songs i think in paul solo canon definitely mm -hmm. and and the fact that he he went uh, on and and decided to release it uh, tells us uh, a lot about his relationship uh, emotional uh, and not only musical relationship with with the beatles at the time because as we were saying it was not a an easy moment in uh, in um, commercial terms and uh, also in critical terms for Paul and can you imagine being uh, one of the one of the two Lennon McCarthy team and being forced to you know <laughs> claim your legacy and uh, struggling uh, at times um, because you don't really know how to relate to to that uh, part of your career and your life mm. it was not a it was not an easy task if you ask me so i think uh, in the end he, he went for for the best approach and uh, he, 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 he you know uh, he tried to relate um, to this um, part the best way so step by step uh, and Nowadays, uh, we 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 can understand what he what he went through and what he was capable to do with his uh, with his legacy and with all the the Beatles uh, material. It was not easy. Today, it seems easier, but we got to remember 
the 80s to understand better how difficult it was for him. Well, it's a strange thing when you're that part of a legacy that only gets bigger through time. <laughs> you know, mm. how do you deal with that. Yeah. It's like Paul said, ever present past. That past <clears throat> is always right in front of him. You know, it seems like, you know, because there's so many things to talk about with the Beatles. It's nonstop. And mm -hmm. you all the time on the group, especially when it comes to books. <laughs> it's just <laughs> pouring out and good ones like yours, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, very much. Uh, what we're going to do uh, next time out, we're going to talk about Flowers in the Dirt. I don't want to miss those bonus tracks on, on Press to Play. And we still haven't gotten to the Russian album and the stuff that Paul did with Phil Ramone. Mm-hmm. So much stuff you know you could say what you want about the second half of the 80s but paul was really prolific back then once you include all the stuff that he didn't release <laughs> you know so you have all the bonus material from from uh press to play and flowers the dirt and all this other stuff so there's plenty more to talk talk about and as well as the new book on band on the run coming from you so uh can't wait till we Get working on those shows. <laughs> Absolutely. I will be very pleased to be to be with you again so we can delve into uh, these topics. Definitely the, the bonus tracks uh, for Press to Play are, are not only a bonus uh, to some uh, are, uh, some of the best things uh, it did. And and uh, and then the, the we can... We can uh, uh, close on this on this point are these really bonus tracks or are they part of the album because we all know that at the time uh the album was issued on lp which has got only 10 songs on cassette which got 10 songs as well and on cd which got 13 songs so which was the main format at the time <laughs> we can close on this on this question and then we can uh we can start the next conversation from there okay sure and then uh you still had hang glide as an instrumental which wasn't on the cd itself yeah but, um... definitely fortunately and um, well maybe my parents uh, were, were not did not agree with me, but fortunately for me, I, I, I managed to to buy anything or everything <laughs> that uh, that was uh, out uh, at the time. And I think there was um there was an article by Mark Lewis on, on the Monthly Beatles or, or or whatever, which complained a bit about the fact that. Uh, uh, you know, there were too many variations and fans were spending a lot of money trying to have um, all this um, variation in the discography. And I was one of them because I, I had uh, all the singles, all the, the mixes and uh, uh, CD, LP, cassette. I got, I got everything at yeah. the time. You know, <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. But anyway, <laughs> that was another, and that's another topic. Yeah. I just was never a big fan of so many remixes. I think it was going overboard, but some of them are really, yeah. cool. but we'll talk about that. In yeah. Shows. So Luca, thanks so much for doing this. And I see you. Uh, the band on the run book just came out in Italy and in English, it's a few weeks from now. Yeah, so we got to wait for the links and stuff, but I will um, share it with you as soon as it's uh, ready. But we're not that far. Okay. So. It's been great, as always, Luca. Thanks for all the, the uh, interesting conversation and all the information that you provide. Again, should not be without this book, Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. The... Um, yeah, the follow-up, you're saying you want to include Paul's next album. And I sure hope that there's an album by the end of this year. That's my big wish. No, it's a, it's a, yeah, I, I am quite convinced too. It's, um, well, it's a big project. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, 
when uh, volume two will come out, we will have for the first time ever, all the songs uh, from Paul discography in two volumes. So we will have a complete uh, uh, kind of um, work about it. And don't forget that we will have volume three at some point about collaborations, which is another big topic. So uh, it it needs time. It needs time because I got all the all the projects and and stuff. I got uh, uh, I worked on a, on a Peter Gabriel book uh, quite recently, which went out in English uh, at the beginning of the year. So there's a lot of things to do, and there would be a, there would be a. a a book on Ringo's songs at some point. Uh, there will be a solo Beatles book at some point because I'm working on um, many projects. <laughs> and <Apparently>. so, <laughs> uh, apparently, apparently, yes, you've got <laughs> so a lot there, of the fire there. So, uh, oh. that's uh, that's a lot of fun, but that's a lot of work as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think, uh, all these kind of uh, initiatives are, are what we need now. There's a there's a definitely uh, an audience who, who, who wants uh, solo Beatles related material and products. Mm -hmm. So we we are all uh, aware uh, uh, of that, and uh, that's my that's my role in this uh, this big. Uh, <laughs> scenario <laughs> you know there's been so many books on the group for the beatles but we need a lot more on the solo stuff no no question about that i mean by, by the way one last thing since you mentioned peter gabriel i have always said that pretty little head sounds like it's got a peter gabriel influence to it oh well, definitely. Well, well, the fact that uh, he got uh, Jerry Marotta, which is uh, an old acquaintance of uh, of Peter, that's that's definitely something. Then, uh, last thing, as you we mentioned, Peter, uh, in analyzing the the drum parts of Band on the Run, mm. I found a, a little, just a little uh, similarities. Uh, because the the style of uh, of the of the drums there, it's uh, at, at, in some spots it's a little bit different, and uh, we can notice, for example, that Paul in many songs does not use symbols very much. Which is, who knows? Peter Gabriel uh, knows and that he experimented mm. with you, Padgham. Uh, in trying not to using symbols and metals in in this third album, right? Uh, so using drums without symbols. Well, there's something in many of the tracks of Banner Run. We we can definitely say that uh, symbols are not used uh, in a, in a typical way uh, as uh, in many other. Paul McCarthy's album. So there's a nice little connection or things to delve, which is part of the new book. Okay. Well, you're getting me ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to have you on once uh, the book is here. So thank you again, Luca. Thanks, Ken, to you. To everybody who's been watching. And uh, for those of you, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do so. I'd greatly appreciate that. And uh, Luca, we'll see you again soon. See you. Bye. Okay. Take care.